Thank you for listening to the Fantasy Writers Tour Shed. I'm your host, Richie Billing, and today we're talking all things romanticy. To help me cover this thriving subject, I'm delighted to be joined by editor Jenya Delima and romanticy author Lara Buckheit. Welcome to the show, chaps. Yeah, thanks for having hey. us. Thank you very much for joining me. I mean, this is a really big subject. Uh, mm. Romance as a whole, I think, is probably the most popular genre out of all of them right now. Uh, and when it comes to fantasy romance, I mean, it's thriving, particularly if I'm with like, young adults. Um, and it's particularly prevalent on social media platforms like TikTok, Instagram. And it just seems to be full of young people really excitedly sharing the favorite romance books and reviews. And I mean, even bookstores have like carved out sections for TikTok recommendations. It's, it's been quite amazing. I mean, I've been querying agents as well. Um, and mine's a, a bit of a high fantasy, but oh, people only want um, romanticy. So it's just a bit of a, what do you do? Do I need to go and uh, add more romance to the story or what, what, what the hell? So this is what one of the, the, the kind of questions that um, we, we've had a lot of emails about. And that's why I'm so keen to, to speak with, with you, you two, because you're so experienced and knowledgeable in this area. Um, I think that's a good place to start is to, to learn a bit about your backgrounds and, and how you got into writing romanticy. So who would like to go first? Go ahead, Jenya. This is your show. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm an editor and I have edited quite a bit of romanticy and it covers all levels, well, various levels of what they call spice. So I do edit a lot of also clean, wholesome romanticy, which is a newer version of romanticy where a lot of it did used to be on the more typical, you know, spicier side. And we're seeing some of that shift into its own subgenre. And it's one of my favorite genres of all to edit just because I love both fantasy and romance. And so then being able to combine them is just sort of like, why would I say no? <laughs> yeah, definitely. What about you, Lara? Um, so I'm Lara Buckeye and I am a romanticy author. I would like to say, I think I am <laughs> at least <laughs> in terms of like, I know the definition we'll probably get into it. A romanticy is very like, uh, everybody is just calls everything romanticy these days. Oh. Um, but my books are very romance focused. It's usually the core of my plot and like what's driving my characters forward. Um, and I, released my debut last year that was also a romanticy novel it's called a realm of ash and shadow and my next release is coming out march 19th and that is our immortal hearts which is also a romanticy book oh congratulations on the upcoming book thank you <laughs> exciting so what i mean you you two are both drawn to this more than any other by the sounds of it so what is it that um appeals to you more than anything hmm. So when I first started out, I did read a lot of fantasy, and I think that's typical. And I mostly read a lot of YA fantasy. And then you started to see sort of this shift where the romance component became a really big part of it. And that gradually happened. And you brought up the social media part, and that's something I've seen even with the books that are chosen for book tours, to be in book boxes, that sort of thing. And so some of the same major book influencers you would have seen five, 10 years ago pushing straight fantasy have now also shifted to romanticy. And I don't necessarily know if it's the trend so much and just picking up on that. And maybe I've also joined that bandwagon. But I also like having a happily ever after. And I like knowing that that's promised in the story. Yeah. What about you, Lara? Um, Well, as a reader or as a writer? Both. Okay, well, as a reader, um, I love romanticy because it's, like, a great avenue to, like, escape. Um, not so much because, you know, it's a fantasy world, but because the romance, like, it just kind of takes you back to those days when you're, like, a teenager and you have your first crush and you're, like, kicking your feet when they're doing something cute. And, like, I find myself doing that, like, when I'm reading and, like, the book boyfriend is saying something. And I'm just like, oh, my God, I love this. <laughs> um, so it's just, like, it just fills me with so much joy. <laughs> and um, as an author, I think 
I am so drawn to romanticy because I didn't grow up seeing a lot of healthy relationships and seeing like I had like a lot of divorced couples in my family and I'm just like that's just not it for me and so I really wanted to write relationships where they're full of romance they like talk through their problems that there's not like the third act breakup and stuff like that so it's just like a good way to manifest what I want in my own life with my husband. (laughs) That's a really interesting point. When you say though that you've you've sort of seen you you've been reading things and you haven't been able to relate to a lot of the stories that you are reading. Um and my my parents were divorced as well. So that would be more appealing to me because it would be more relatable. So it's really amazing that you've you've chosen to write something that is more um relevant to you yeah so and, and important issues as well um so yeah i'm that sounds brilliant and one thing i was reading um if it's been covered a lot this rise in romanticity in the media especially in um the uk and i was reading the guardian recently and they were trying to get into the nuts and bolts of why it's so popular um and a lot of the things that you said um uh, the escapism and and the happily ever afters and the at, at the sort of heart of it all it's this um the stories are like ones of hope like you, you hope that you're gonna meet someone that you're gonna you hope you're gonna spend the rest of your lives together and all them kind of things and and that's what these stories i imagine offer a lot of and now he can be like something. a fake king or something instead of some boring <laughs> mortal <laughs> exactly yeah. yeah and that's the that's the brilliant thing about it um mixing it up with fantasy um so is this quite has it been going uh, this sort of fusion is it more recent or has it been around a while can you tell us a bit about the the history behind romanticy so i've read a lot of articles about this and even if you go back and you read older fantasy novels there is a romance aspect to so many of them and i was thinking about common tropes that we see in romance that are then applied to romanticy and one of them that is Specific to romanticity is the idea of, again, because you could fall in love with someone like an elf or a fae and you're immortal. Well, what happens then when they outlive you? And we see a little bit of that, at least in the movie versions pushed upon us and with Lord of the Rings. So it's not as if that's been completely absent from fantasy, but I do think that it has picked up a lot of steam. And I think a lot of that is because of just what's been happening in our own world in the past few years and that we do want to have that like you were saying that bit of hope in these books. So it was there, but it didn't always fully combine the romance aspect where it hit all those romance tropes and expectations. Yeah. What do you think, Lara? I think that fan like romanticy is becoming well is such like a huge thing right now is because there's been a like a shift um in uh, like the booky, the bookish girlies and like just people who read these books, um, especially like the books that trend spicier or smuttier or whatever you want to say, um, is that it's more accepted for people to read these kinds of books with these like sexual elements. Whereas like if these people were to be on Instagram saying that they're like watching porn, like you're going to, it's, it's going to be frowned upon. But if you're yeah. like, no, I'm reading about this high Lord plowing, you know, <laughs> this mortal girl, it's like, Oh, okay. That's kind of hot. And yeah. so I just think that it's like a, a liberation kind of factor as well. Cause it's like just something we can own. Like, Oh yeah, guys, they can be like, yeah, I watch porn all the time. But then like us girlies, we can be like, Oh yeah, we read our little smut books and we're happy about it. <laughs> Oh no, it's romance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do you think like books? Well, probably Fifty Shades of Grey is probably the one of the most famous. Do you think that sort of changed the game a bit? Because it, I mean, everyone was like ne- given a lot of negative criticism to it and stuff like that. But it did sell a lot of books. A lot of people liked it. It was a bit of a phenomenon. I mean, do you think things like that have changed the acceptance of of them kind of spicier books? Maybe. I think part of it too, and this is just going to marketing studies where people tend to go to the same types of books over and over and over again. And so the one romantic book that I think about all the time is the one that really opened the floodgates was A Court of Thorns and Roses, because now, of course, everything gets compared to it. 
And so many people want to mimic that style or that world building or that relationship. Something from it has inspired them to create their own work. But at the time, how many other options did you have after you read that series and you wanted more of that? And yeah. so I think that really helped too, where you just, and it's sort of like Harry Potter also. You just need that one book or that one series where people are like, okay, wow, I really love this and I want more like this. Nice, yeah. It's amazing, isn't it? What do you think, Lara? No, I absolutely agree with that. I definitely think that uh, Fifty Shades of Grey might have made it more mainstream. Um, because I remember like people were reading those books with no shame out in public. <laughs> and I'm like, I know what you're reading and I'm yeah. here for it. Um, but I think in the like romanticy aspect, I do think that it leans more into the escapism and like that hope and that desire that like for something more. Yeah. I mean, we've mentioned a few um, phrases there. So if someone who's not familiar with romanticy, they might not know what that means, but you can probably guess, but like smutty, <laughs> spicy, spicy stories, that's probably like one end of the romanticy spectrum, would you say? Could you tell us a bit about like the different types of romanticy stories? Because I imagine you get the quite the tame rom-coms. Like the uh, the hot the, 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 the like the the sort of holiday films that you have on like the sort of twenty four hour movie channels and stuff like that, um, and then I imagine you basically get like the the porn. <laughs> so, can you tell us a bit about that? Yes, there is going to be a spectrum as far as what people are comfortable with reading, what people are comfortable with writing. So I do a lot, and this doesn't seem to be the predominant side of the spectrum. But there are some that are clean or what they call feel good, sweet, wholesome, or there might be a kiss or a little bit more than that, or it'll be fade to black, even in some cases. And then others that are on the complete opposite side with everything in between. And then, of course, with YA romance, you're going to have a much more toned down version. Sometimes, not often anymore, but sometimes you won't even see them kiss so much as there's just that romantic interest is expressed. And then they acknowledge it at the end and they've come together as a couple, but you don't actually see any physical interaction in that way. Interesting. What about you, Lara? What kind of, uh, where, where do your stories fall on the spectrum? Um, well, it's subjective. Uh, like the spice meter. I know like people use like the little emojis that are like peppers. <laughs> um, and so it's funny because with my debut, a lot of people would be like, oh, it's two peppers. And then some people would be like, it's three. And I'm like, okay. And then one person's like, it's one. So tame. And I'm like, okay, well there's on page sex. It's not tame. <laughs> um, and then with our mortal hearts, <laughs> it is a very spicy, <laughs> Um, so I would say that one is probably closer to four, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's like straight erotica, but there are like, there's plot. It, it's plot, a lot of plot and smut. Um, but yeah, I would say it's somewhere in the middle. I think uh, I'm a comfortable three peppers. Yeah. So you, you, you both mentioned a few interesting things there that can probably help people gauge where their sort of stories up to. So obviously the age of the audience that you're writing for mm -hmm. because you've got to be careful about them things if you're writing for YA for example um and also um what you said Lara it's just gone out my head <laughs> oh with like how many um scenes there are and like yeah, if it's on page the sort of balance between the plot and the, mm -hmm. the spicier side of things yeah um <laughs> So that, that's probably a good little gauge to sort of keep in mind uh, for people. What do you think? Do you reckon that will help? Yeah, I agree. And I do think there's, you know, the pepper thing too, because we do see that a lot in book reviews, which is also why then if you are a reader who's interested in romanticy, or maybe you're just getting into it and you sort of know where your own comfortable, you know, level with that is, find someone who enjoys the same books as you and see maybe what they're reading and what <laughs> pepper level they apply to it and how they interpreted yeah. it. Because I've seen that too, where there can be a wild variation between whoever has read it and how they feel about it in terms of spice level. I've also seen it referred to like the the on-page steamier, spicier parts referred to um, like in regards to pepper level, like it'll be lower level if it's like happening, but it's like in their head. 
Um, um, and it's more about like thoughts and feelings. Yeah. And then it'll be on the heavier side of the peppers if it's like more in and out. Um, oh, I, see. <laughs> I don't know if that's the a blow, good blow, description. Blow, blow. Yeah. <laughs> and so I try to find like a nice blend yeah. um, of both feelings and in and out. <laughs> there are a lot of reviewers who will list their their spiciness ratings. You know, they'll they'll include it even like in their link tree or whatever on their account. Here is how I denote each of these peppers, and here's how I define what they mean to me. So <laughs> again, you can get a good idea of well, is there two peppers my version of two peppers, or yeah. is this gonna be more like a twelve for me? I know and people I've seen people use like the green just regular pepper as like <laughs> fade to black and I'm like what? <laughs> <laughs> well, that sounds like it's a, a good thing to do then to, to spend a bit of research seeing what how people define these kind of things because you want to you want to make sure you you meet people's expectations don't you when you're writing yeah I mean even as an editor and having a pretty good idea of what's on the market and what's coming out I did pick one up that someone said was a fairy tale retelling and there wasn't really a lot of information provided past that. And it was my version of five peppers. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> so it was not what I expected at all. Not much of a retelling as, a, as, as other things. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we mentioned before, of course, A Thorn and Roses um, as one of the, the sort of best examples of romanticity. Are there any other books that you'd both recommend? Uh, maybe from books from different levels of the pepper spectrum to give people a bit of an idea so i'm most familiar with the books i've edited just because that's where most of my reading takes place now but if you're looking for something that's on the cleaner or more wholesome end, stormy blacks series is really really good and it's fun but it's not like saccharine sweet or anything either so it's very fun and i really like margaret margaret rogerson's books Hers have all been very fun again, YA fantasy, so it tends to not be as spicy, but her world building is, I think it's beautifully done. Nice. What about you, Laura? Um, On the sweeter end, I would say Divine Rivals. Um, there is like one on-page scene, but it's not graphic. Um, so I would say you're good. And then on the spicier end, I would say like literally anything adult by scarlet st Clair, um like a touch of darkness i know that went like viral on tiktok and all the girlies were like eating it up um and it is very explicit um but then you have like authors like um jennifer l armantrout um from blood nash i would say that leans more fantasy than romanticy because but there is like on page sex at the end um, and then apparently the rest of the books just get progressively more spicy. Um, I haven't read them, so I can't speak to that. But I know like people were eating that up as well. Um, and I'm trying to think of any other ones, but I don't know. There's it's a, a lot. Little, it's a good reading list for people there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, there's a, you say they're like people eating things up, like things going viral. Is there any sort of key features of these books that make them go so viral and so popular do you think um i would say probably the tropes yeah um included like i know a lot of viral books that i've seen are ones that feature tropes like touch her and you'll die um enemies to lovers there's always like a morally gray love interest who will like burn the world for the main character um <laughs> what else is there um oh uh, people really like there's only like one horse and only one bed um <laughs> right that would just so easy to do when they're stopping at inns and stuff along the way oh no <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> makes the journey um, journey scenes a bit more interesting though i imagine <laughs> Oh, and Faded Mates. That's a big one. Everybody loves Faded Mates. Oh, nice. So could yeah, you, for like anyone who's not familiar with these tropes, because could they could give us a bit more information? So Faded Mates, I imagine, two people meant to be together. Yeah. Or something's going to stop them not. from doing that, I imagine. Bit of a classic Romeo and Juliet vibe, is it, I imagine. Um. Yeah, sometimes. Sometimes it's just like, all right, 
they're fated mates, but now they have to like join together to like beat this this baddie. <laughs> oh, nice, nice. Uh, enemies yeah. to lovers is one I've heard a lot of. Can you give us yes. some examples of that one? Of enemies to lovers. Yeah, I can think of a lot in contemporary fiction just because it's usually they have something that they both want a lot of the time when they feel like they both cannot get it. So I guess in fantasy, you could use something like ascension to a throne or something, you know, like either I can have this position of power or you can. And so naturally you assume that the other person is your enemy instead of trying to find a way to work around it. And then of course, as you encounter them more and more, oh no, you fell in love. But there's usually that resistance to falling in love with that person as well, which is a big part of it. Yeah. Because I think it's important too to mention that with romanticy, since we're bringing in the romance genre, that we have to have that heavy character arc. It can't just be the fantasy world holding it all together. And that character arc is almost always going to be tied to whoever their love interest is. And great, here's a dog. And <laughs> And what it is about that love interest that is sparking these feelings inside of them and why it's bringing out something different in them. Nice. I know. Um, I don't think there's any spice in it. I never finished the series. People will kill me if they find that out. But um, the cruel prince is apparently like God tier enemies to lovers. Okay. I did <laughs> love that one too. I have read that yeah. series and loved it. Okay. Um, another one would be, Kingdom of the Wicked, that trilogy was enemies to lovers, um, in a sense. And yeah. I think um, King of Battle and Blood was also enemies to lovers, in a sense. Um, yeah, I think that's a good start. You'll, it, yeah. Nice. And you mentioned another one, which sounded quite interesting. Um, Touch me or I'll die kind of thing. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Tell us a bit about that one. Um, so basically, it's the sense of somebody touches, like, or, like, assaults, or this sounds so bad, um, or, like, does something to the female main character, and the male main character, who's her love interest, just goes, like, absolutely feral, and, like, usually kills them or maims them in some kind of way. Interesting. Yeah, very broody alpha male. Oh, yeah. So it's, like, the protective <laughs> elements kind of thing. I think so. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. It's a, uh, yeah, there's a lot of, uh, like you say, uh, you've got these sort of, these tropes. I'm, I'm guessing they all carry certain expectations for readers. So yeah. you can't deviate too much from them. Um, but it's interesting when you start mixing the fantasy elements. Thank you very much for listening to today's show. This is just a, a very quick break to share some messages from our sponsors. This is a paid advertisement by Fictionary. Fictionary is a tool that offers writers a structured approach to editing. It was created by best-selling author Christina Stanley and was designed using her knowledge and insights. Let's face it, not many writers enjoy editing. It can be laborious and with so much to analyze and consider, it can be tough to get right to. Fictionary seeks to tackle these problems. After you upload your manuscript and enter the details of your scenes and chapters and the nature of your book, it'll present you with graphics and overviews that analyze your story. It breaks down things like character arcs, story arcs, and it can measure the developments of your story compared to what would be expected by other readers in the genre. Fictionary also offers the opportunity to get key developmental help with your stories. And this can help you adjust and tweak the structure so that it flows like a river. It takes you through a very simple process uh, that guides you through um, the process of building your story up layer by layer. It can help beginner writers and it can also help experienced writers too, which makes it a very unique and useful tool. I've used the tool myself and I found the visual overviews and the analysis very helpful indeed. Um, the more time you spend using the two, the more familiar you become with its analytical functions, and that will see you get the very, very best results. So if you're looking for more advanced support with your editing, but you don't quite have the budget for an editor, try Fictionary. It's uh, free for 14 days, and you don't have to enter any credit card information to get that trial. And also as a very special offer to listeners of the Fantasy Writers Toolshed, 
you can get 25% off the first six months of your monthly subscription or six months off the first year of your annual subscription. The code is FWT25 and you can head to fictionary.co forward slash FWT to find out more. Thank you for listening to the Fantasy Writers Toolshed. If you'd like to join our writing community on Discord and get access to fantasy writing classes and books on Patreon, check the links in the description. And if you don't want to miss any future episodes, be sure to follow or subscribe. And to support the show, leave a quick rating on Spotify or iTunes and share this episode on social media or with anyone who you think may be interested. Thank you very much for listening. Enjoy the show. So that's a nice sort of segue into actually writing romance to um, And I think because there is, you, you, you bring in two genres together, it, it's going to be a lot more complicated than people think. So I mean, from you, your perspective of both editing and writing romance to what are your sort of views on the whole process? Well, I think it brings opportunities though, too, because you get to take some of these really well-known tropes and you get to have this entirely new, fresh perspective. And part of it is because you're bringing in all of these fantasy world building elements or the tropes that you've seen in fantasy. And now we're going to overlay this romance trope on top of it. But I do think primarily, especially for writing or editing, you have to be incredibly familiar with both genres and the expectations of both genres because you're balancing both of them now and readers are going to expect to see both. They don't want to just see, I'm calling it romantic, but there's no actual world building. It feels like the story is just taking place in Chicago, but people have magic for some reason. There has to be more than that. You have to really understand how to have a magic system incorporated into your story. What goes into explaining a magic system and making it feel like a natural piece. So all that really has to come together and feel seamless, but without sacrificing the romance part. Nice. Laura, what do you think? Um, so for me, I just love putting romance like in a fantasy world. Like I can dream of like this fantasy world and then I'm like, all right, now I know what I want my like the world to be. And now I just need to figure out like what obstacles I'm going to put in the way for the this couple. And then usually I just kind of tie that to the world building, but still also trying to tie it to like their character arc. Um nice for both of them well in this most recent book I, I have dual point of view for the first time ever um and so it's been very interesting to manage two character arcs and like the romance between them um but yeah i definitely just like create the world and then i just do whatever i want <laughs> <laughs> i do find that with fantasy a lot of people do tend to start with a setting and i think it's it definitely helps because it, it's the job of the writer to create that unique world, isn't it? Or that unique environment. And then with it being romance, I'm guessing fantasy aside, the focus is on the characters, isn't it? Yes. The plot is almost always secondary in romance of any kind. And so we see that a lot in romance too. I don't want to say always because it's not always the case, but the majority of them, yeah, the plot is going to be secondary too them falling in love and then accepting that they're in love and then again the happily ever after mm. so jenny you obviously uh you, you've been through a lot of these books and you've seen these character arcs develop and some i imagine have quite worked and um, so what kind of things have you you recommended to writers to help them improve the character arcs and their romance stories a lot of it is going to come down to just the gmc the goal mode of conflict and that's the same advice that I would give to anyone writing in almost any genre, but it's going to really, really heavily apply here, and especially with the conflict in terms of them falling in love or them acknowledging that they're falling in love with this person. There has to be a really good reason that they're holding back from that. It can't just be and eh, because I'm afraid of it or because I say so. It has to feel insurmountable in some way. And part of that's because with romance, especially, we know how the story is going to end. We know they're going to get together, but we need there to be some compelling reason to see why it seems like that might not happen so that we can see how they get over that. Hmm. Interesting. Lara, as the writer, how do you do that then? 
how do I do that? Well, <laughs> I hire an editor. <laughs> um, there you now, go. <laughs> I think, um, I think I just go into it knowing where I <clears throat> like where the characters are starting and where I want them to end up. So like, I always know like, this is where they're at. This is their obstacle individually. And then as a couple, and then this is where I want them to end up individually and as a couple. And I always try to mirror that to like the opening scene or whoever's point of view. And I think I do a pretty good job at it because Jenya actually commented on my thing. It was like, oh my God, you did a great job with this. So <laughs> Yeah. I mean, one of the hardest things for me when it comes to characters is is getting to really know them and understand them. Like what what are they afraid of? What motivates them? And when it comes to romance, um, I think it's something that we're all looking for in life. We're all looking for love. Um, but we do have bad experiences, which can shape how we approach things in the future. Um, and sometimes the the kind of things that we see like growing up, the examples that we see there can impact how we approach relationships down the line. So do you kind of go into these things when you're creating your characters? get really like um into it on like a, a sociological and like a psychological level i think so i i had this book it's like the character emotions like the saurus or something where like i would yeah. go through like the character wounds that like each character has and um for my debut or of ash and shadow um val the main character um has was just like neglected from her father and like just shipped off to this like other realm and so she really never had that like love because her mom was dead like her dad didn't want her and so she never let herself really form attachments because of that because nobody wanted to be attached to her and so that's reflected in like everything that she does and she's very impulsive she's stubborn she like won't admit like her feelings and so when she does start feeling an attachment to like the person she's bound to she's like unsure and she's flighty and she's self-sabotaging and it's just all stemming back to like that original wound of neglect and fear of loss Justin what do you think Jenny? Yeah, I think that the psychological background is such an interesting component, but it's also necessary. And so for editing, my master's degree is in developmental psychology. So nice. it might seem like <laughs> my careers are incredibly different, but really they're not. Because it's just like with real people, those past events and experiences are what shaped us and what led us to have a lot of the beliefs and the attitudes and behaviors that we have now. And so when we see the characters too, our readers want to understand why they're doing what they're doing at every single step. Because just like anything with character consistency, as soon as they act in a way that does not feel like that character, there needs to be a really good reason for it. And if you can't explain that, given this background that you set up for them, it's probably not going to work. And so that's why I think it's incredibly important to really have a solid grasp on who they are and what shaped them. Yeah. I imagine these individual complexities, um, like resolving them, coming to terms with them, that is a part, a big part of the story in these romance stories. Because so often it's it's us that are the biggest obstacles in in finding happiness and get coming to terms with past experiences and whatnot. So, yeah, it's um, the the character development side. I imagine is hugely important, isn't it? Oh yeah. It's vital. With you don't really have a solid romance if you're missing that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So, what would you recommend then if you've got if someone's out there is listening and they they feel like the character is quite flat? How would you recommend that they could improve things a little bit? Well, one of the ideas I've seen is taking your character on a date and asking you know on a date and asking them all those questions you would ask this person that you're on a date with we really want to get to know them and you're sort of trying to suss out your relationship prospects with this person but then imagining that you're the person with your character so that you can pull all that information out of them or you can fill in those blanks yourself and see how they'd react how they would respond why they would respond that way and you really have to think of them like a real person 
remove yourself from thinking about this as my character because it's too easy to get trapped in that mindset of, I have to come up with all this stuff. You have all that stuff in you to create this person. You just need to really give yourself full permission to do it and to strip off anything that's stopping you from doing it. Nice. Lyle, what do you think? Um, I think my biggest tip would be to give them a hobby. Um, I almost always give them a hobby that is tied to one of their like biggest fears or they're like uh, one of their traits. And so, um, for example, in Our Mortal Hearts, uh, Rory, she really loves flower pressing. And it's because, you know, she liked preserving the beauty of something. So it lives on forever when she's literally about to be sacrificed for this like ritual. And so like her whole hobby is preserving life when she's about to lose hers. And so I think that doing that kind of adds another layer of complexity when you actually make them a person because if they have hobbies then they're real yeah and i see i saw on tiktok that a lot of people complain when the male love interest doesn't have a hobby outside of just obsessing over the female love interest so just give them a hobby and you will be okay yeah that would be a pretty big red flag in real life (laughs) i know you know it is like what you do with all your time Stalk yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> well, those yeah. are a different genre, Jenya. Was <laughs> <laughs> that a trope? Is it stalking romance? They're the stalker Stalk- romance. Twilight, Stalkers yes. to lovers. <laughs> Round them I down eventually. Set that up as one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. Um, one thing I was going to ask you um, is pretty more from probably like an editing perspective. So if For example, you've got a story and there is a romantic element, Mm -hmm. um, but it's not not shining through enough. It's not really connecting with the readers. Do you have any sort of um, strategies, methods or devices that you would turn to to help um, bring that side to the fore a bit more? Well, first I would want to check with the author to make sure that they intend to have this in the romantic genre. Because again, we can have that love interest component or a love story, but it's not necessarily going to be romanticy. And so sometimes they might just feel like, you know what? I don't really have that in me. When I see everything that has to go into it, I'm not really sure that I'm headed in that direction. So then we might not worry about it so much. But if I do talk to them and they want to see that it's going to be in the romanticy genre, I tend to talk a lot about what's expected within a romance and then touching on a lot of those romance beats. So we need to see them meeting together. We need to see that initial attraction, even if it's attraction that they don't want to admit. The chemistry is going to be incredibly important, but it also cannot just be chemistry. So sometimes it's adding in those little moments where we're really seeing them connect because that's usually where that relationship starts to feel real and like it's a relationship that you want to root for. It's not when they're making out against a brick wall or in the tavern with their one bed trope. It's when, you know, he's like saddling her horse for her without asking. Yeah. Or they're having a cute little domestic scene together where they're helping each other out in the kitchen or something. And it's just sort of like in real life too. When do you fall in love with someone? You know, it is those little moments where they show respect and care for the other person that we pick up on it. So it's going to be the same way within any romance type of book. It's interesting. I always think it's the little things that make relationships like the little thoughtful things. And I was, I was reading a quote recently and I I thought, I thought it was excellent, an excellent sort of insight into how relationships develop, because I don't know, I always thought that the sort of love at first sight thing was a bit bit like Hollywood bullshit. Um, but this sort of explanation is quite good. It's so you, you you begin with the common interests. So like you say, you've got hobbies that you might you might share interests in, something like that, or some kind of uh, subject matter like sports or something. And then them common interests allow you to to bond, and over time you sort of build the fondness for each other, and that fondness then can build to infatuation um, and. This is an important point, is if there's no nothing to disturb the harmony, then the infatuation will become m- more like devotion and then eventually love. Um, and the true test of love is personal sacrifice. 
I thought it was a really um, quite a sort of cutting um, <laughs> definition of uh, how relationships develop, but it makes sense that mm-hmm. there's these sorts of stages. And when you think about like the common interests, then you say them experiences that you mentioned, Jenya, and then to build further and not have any conflict in it to disrupt that love. I think that's where you can sort of really get into interest and territory by throwing yeah. a few spanners in the works. <laughs> they talk about self-sacrifice, which is often what we see in romance with what they call the grand gesture, mm. where one character goes to some really massive extreme in order to prove their love to the other person. So in you know, like typical rom-coms, it might be, I took a flight across the country to stop this person from taking this job. In <laughs> romance, it might be something like, oh, you know, the bad guy is about to kill so-and-so. I'm going to dive in front of them before their magic hits them. There's always that one, yeah, that major self-sacrificial moment usually that, yeah, comes out. But again, it's not going to have that same impact if we don't have all the little moments leading up to it. Nice. Uh, what do you think? I am obsessed with quiet moments and I think they are what really just makes a story because those are the things. And like when I say quiet moments, I mean the moments that you would think you'd have like art commissioned for or that like people are going to just take the time out of their day to like draw art for this because it like was just so sweet. And usually it is like those domestic moments or like just moments of kindness, like wound tending um, or um, like the, the horse saddling one is a good one. Jenya. Yeah. I, I'm going to make oh, a note of that. <laughs> uh, but, Something quite nurturing and caring. Yeah. Just to show yeah. that there is that, that level of care and like a safe place to be. Yeah. I think mm-hmm. like, if you're trying to get in the mindset of of that character there, you, you're not thinking about yourself or anyone else. You're thinking only about that person. Right. And yeah, I think, yeah, that's a good place to look at it. Well, and they've shown too with romance, some of the studies that we tend to insert ourselves into the shoes of the main character. And so while it's nice when someone wants to come to our apartment with a boom box to declare their love and mm-hmm. sing our favorite song, it's those little tiny moments of consideration and showing that they've listened to us and they understand us where we have that, this is how I want to be treated. I want someone who loves me like this. And I think that's what those quiet moments do. Nice. Um, I also, there's one moment that like really stands out to me and it was in one of the Akatar books. So a court of thorns and roses. Um, but it was when the main character, Feyre, was wearing the male love interest's like cardigan or sweater or something while she was painting and i was just like that is such a tender thing to do like are you missing him so much you just wore his sweater and so (laughs) like even that it just like really stuck with me and i was just like wow Mm. interesting so i've got one more question for you um what advice would you have for anyone who's thinking about giving romance see a go? Read as much as you can. And that's my advice for everything, just because it helps you get an idea of what it's actually like, what you can expect from the genre, which helps you then understand what to include in your own book. But it also helps you see what works for you and what doesn't work for you. So maybe there's a trope you just really don't like that's prevalent throughout romanticy. And now you know to avoid that because You've seen book after book where it just did not click with you. Nice, great bit of advice. What about you, Lara? Uh, I'm going to echo that. Just read far and wide. Um, a lot of it you might not like, and that's okay. It's just finding like what works for you, what works for your own writing. Um, it's just understanding reader expectations and i feel like you can only do that once you are like a uh, like an avid reader of the genre yeah get to know them pepper scores yeah yeah <laughs> go stalk some bookstagrammers and look at their pepper score ratings and then you'll know find yeah. out what you're comfortable with <laughs> nice oh it's been brilliant chatting with you both i think we've covered the subject pretty comprehensively there i have to say i've learned loads um i hope listening at home you you've learned something new there too uh, how how's uh where's the best place to find out a bit more about you, you both? Jenny, do you want to go first? 
And sure. So my website is just jennyaedits.com and there is a contact me form there. You can see a sample of my portfolio. I also have events listed on there, not as updated as it could be, where if you'd like to go see me speak or meet up with me somewhere, I love doing that. I love meeting everybody. I love talking about writing and publishing and editing all day long. Mm -hmm. And then I also am on the writing and editing podcast and the link should be on my website. Awesome. awesome. What links for the description there, Lara, how, how can we find more about you? Um, I also have a website. It's larabuckeye.com. Um, but you could probably just contact me quicker on Instagram at Lara on fire. Um, I'm also on TikTok at Lara on fire writes. Oh, the kitty cat. <laughs> cat's just, <okay. laughs> oh. Um, I have a few live events coming up this year that I'll be at. I'll be signing at Imaginarium Book Festival um, in June. I'll be at Fright Reads. Uh, and yeah, so I'll just be all over the place this year. Oh, busy one for you. But we'll put yeah. the links for everything in the description. So if anyone I'll wants to check out the books, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Get down, check it out. Well, yeah, thank you very much again. It's been a lovely chat with you both. Uh, thank you at home for listening. <laughs>